now we are live hello everyone welcome to the uh, uh on breast cancer organized by science communications hope nigeria in collaborations with uh, trends in africa and with support from africana server of africa with us the uh, speakers from different backgrounds and in medicine as well as uh, an expertise in breast cancer with us here professor ayodeji who is a professor of cancer and a deputy vice chancellor academics from onabanjo university ogun state the second speaker we have here with us is uh, Dr. Ad who holds uh, he medicine and masters in public health here in Nigeria who is now the current of the Nigerian Cancer Society he said more light and create more awareness among the with us again, as part of the speak, Dr. Muhammad Inu Mustafa. He's Dr. Muhammad uh, Inu Mustafa, who is also a consultant and a clinical uh, <laughs> We also have as part of our speaker, Dr. Rahmat Mohammed Nasser, who is a graduate of medicine from University Lori and holds a professional certificate in leadership and management in health from University of Washington, DC, who is currently a candidate for masters in business administration and masters in public health, both at Amadou Bello University mm -hmm. area. She is currently a resident doctor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of the University of Ilori Teaching Hospital and an IT doctor with knowledge of web designing. Uh, you are welcome, uh, Dr. Ahmad. And we, with us here, we have uh, a cancer survivor uh, who is a physiologist by training uh, by name uh, Raida Hamza, holds a BSc degree in physiology she is a mother of three, an entrepreneur, and the founder of Rumbi Me, or a group she founded four years ago for the discussions of issues concerning womanhood, relationship, finances, health, as well as the other habits. So before, uh, without further ado, uh, we would like to welcome all the speakers and finals of our uh, experts here to this uh, webinar. And uh, we hope you will enjoy our webinar for uh, breast cancer to mark the Breast Cancer Day, which is 25th of uh, October. Uh, our speakers, you are all welcome. So uh, I will start by the first speaker, who is uh, Dr. Mahmoud Inua, a consultant uh, radio radiation oncology, uh, to answer us these first questions. Dr. Mohammed, are you with us? Is Dr. Mohammed here? Dr. Mohammed, are we are you with us? Hello. Dr. Mohammed, can you hear us? Okay, in the absence of him being present, Dr. Fatima, can you hear me? Thank you. 
Dr. Fatima, can you answer us these questions? Uh, what is breast cancer and what causes it? Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dr. Fatima Anga. I sincerely apologize for the profile initially. I actually thought I sent it, but then obviously it wasn't sent earlier. Um, okay, the question on what is breast cancer and what causes it, I would like to start by explaining what cancer is. Cancer is actually an abnormal proliferation of um, or growth of cells beyond um, their anatomical confinement on in any part of the body. So that's briefly what cancer is. And in the case of breast cancer, is the abnormal growth or proliferation of cells beyond its anatomical confinement in the breast specifically. Um, there are actually different types of breast cancer, and this depends on the cells that the breast, uh, that is involved in the cancer. Um, the breast is actually made up of three three main parts, the lobules, the ducts, and then the connective tissues. Um, um, as we broadly know, the lobules are the organs that actually produce Hello? the milk. The ducts actually help to transport the milk to the nipple, and then... Batman, we can't hear you. Hello, can you hear me now? Hello? Dr. Fatima, we can't hear you. Hello? Hello? Okay, I... I Hello? I can... Hello, Dr. Muhammad, are you online? Okay, I can hear you, but I can answer the question. I think the question uh what is breast cancer and the causes of breast cancer so breast cancer is the commonest malignancy is the commonest malignancy in the world and also in nigeria if you look at the global com if you look at the global com 2020 breast cancer account for 11.7 percent of the total cancer worldwide and is the leading is is, is the leading based on the epidemiology and also in nigeria if you look at the, it account for almost like 38% of the total cancer. So even Nigeria is the commonest malignancy. And also, if you look at the causes, we have what we call a risk factors. There are different risk factors that lead to breast cancer. We have a genetic, and also the genetic which comprises of the BRCA gene 1, 2, which comprises of like 30% of the genetic cause. And also we have other causes like the family history. And also family history, if a relative has a breast cancer, so there is chances for the older sibling to have. And also we have the age. People with age of 50 and above also have a higher risk compared to the lower, uh, to the age that is below 50. And also, but there is, there is another variant of breast cancer, like triple negative, which you can see in younger age, younger than 50. And also other risk factors, we have what we call endocrine risk factors. That's the early menarche and late menarche. So all these are the risk factors. And also, if a woman have a breast cancer on one of the breasts, so she's at risk of having the risk for the other breast is at risk. So these are the commonly commonly risk factors for the breast cancer. So I don't, I can hear you. I can just thank you. Yeah, just thank you so much, um, Dr. Mohammed. Uh, I hope the participants are following us uh, with hear about what breast cancer is and what causes it and the risk factors associated with it. Uh, without further ado, uh, I would like to call on the second speaker to 
answer all of these questions, what preventive measures can we take against breast cancer? This question goes to uh, Dr. Mohammed Nasir Ramat. Are you online? Yes, um, thank you um, for inviting me. Um, what, are, what are the preventive measures we can take against um, breast cancer? According to what the first speaker have said, that there are many factors that can easily, there are many risk factors that can cause um, breast cancer. And many of these factors are cause, have a cause over a lifetime, which can inflict breast, can, breast cancer risk. This particular risk factor, some can be changed, including the, some cannot be changed, which include the age at, men, the age at menarche, the age at menopause, um, increase in age, why some risk factor um, can be changed, which we can, can be changed. And as such, that is where our uh, our preventive measure we nearly move to. And the first thing the preventive measure we put is um, keeping a, a healthy weight. And part of the keeping healthy weight is um, having a good eating habit, um, a physical activity, um, optimal sleep and stress reduction. Studies have shown that um, um, breast cancer is increased in women who are obese compared to women who are not obese. And it is, we are in the um, increase in technology now that any patient even gets into the hospital, we can measure whether he or, uh, he or he is overweight, underweight, obese, whether class one, class two, or class three. By getting an application, they can easily determine their, base, um, their BMI. It is very easy. Just going online, you can easily deduce that. Then the second thing that we are, can also use is the preventive method is having um, um, exercise regularly. At least a 30 minute exercise um, daily is um, part of the preventive measure. In addition, is also to take food and vegetable and avoid um, content such as alcohol. For, for those that take alcohol, it is important they reduce the level of the alcohol they are taking. It is important that we are not just talking about breast cancer with you. Breast cancer can affect men and women. And these preventive measures are also important, especially the ones that are pertaining towards uh, men, men especially. Additional thing is breastfeeding um, our children. Studies have also shown that um, children, women who breastfeed their, uh, their children have a low risk compared to women who doesn't have who doesn't breastfeed their, their children. Then, in addition, I think for, for those that have a family history of breast cancer, it is important that they take um, a genetic screening for BRCA1 and BRCA2, which one of our speakers is going to mention much more important why there is need for us to undergo a genetic screening. I can remember vividly about a, um, a Nollywood um, actress, Angelina Jolie. And then Jodi has a family history of breast cancer. She went ahead to have a prophylactic um, radical mastectomy, that is, the surgery of removing of both breasts. Since she has um, BRCA1 and BRCA2 positive from the screening she did, then she decided to do a prophylactic surgery to prevent the onset of the what, of the cancer um, itself. And the last thing I'm going to mention about the preventive measure is one of the things that some, um, I would like to say, some non medics are using as an opportunity to bring down or to reduce the use of um, oral contraceptive pills. Ordinarily, studies have shown that there is a low risk of um, breast cancer in those that use birth control pills. I am not saying that there is a high risk of breast cancer in a woman who uses what oral contraceptive pills. And the study that you really showed is that there is a small risk in one in 7,690 women that uses an oral contraceptive pills for more than a year. At least we find people that use other contraceptive for more than a year. And that is the um, avenue where non medics use in selling their trimedical product, able to bring down the issue of um, use of contraception. An important thing again is the benefit of the oral contraceptive pill is even much more than the risk. The oral contraceptive pill have shown that for women who use oral, contra um, oral contraceptive pill have a low risk of having ovarian cancer, colon cancer, and some other cancer, compared to just a low risk of, what, of having breast cancer. Also, in addition, we should note that not just a single risk factor can cause breast cancer. Breast cancer can occur as a result of combination of risk factor coming together to what to cause um, what we call um, a, um, breast cancer. And lastly, is the use of oral um, homo replacement therapy. And it is advised that it is important that homo replacement therapy is also associated with increased risk of breast cancer in women. Homo replacement therapy are, um, are drugs, literally, they are drugs that are used for women as, um, during their menopausal period as a result of reduction in some hormone in their body. It is important that at least a little should be used, or most importantly, um, it shouldn't be used for a longer period of, of time. 
so that the risk of what they can easily reduce the risk of what breast cancer in them. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Rahmat, for answering us these questions. And then next, we can go over to the president himself, uh, who is the uh, Dr. Adamu, who is the president of the Nigerian Cancer Society, to answer us these questions about uh, are there any policies uh, locally or internationally in place concerning screening and preventions of this breast cancer? Well, um, thank you very much, the organizers of this program, for having me today. Uh, my name is Dr. Adam Alessio Omar, I'm the president of the Nigerian Cancer Society, the umbrella body of all cancer NGOs in Nigeria. Um, the Nigerian Cancer Society is a strong advocate uh, towards uh, policies, policies of government that has direct connection with cancer. Um, listening to the first speaker, Dr. Mohammed Mustafa Inua, you know, highlighting the fact that breast cancer is the most common form of cancer in the world, and of course in Nigeria, and uh, he highlighted the burden of cancer in Nigeria to be around 37.9% of the total cancers. Uh, that is very alarming. <clears throat> Uh, I want to also highlight that uh, Nigeria is in the top three of the 20 countries that have the highest burden of breast cancer in Africa. Mauritius is number one. Hey. Hello, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Very good. Um, unfortunately, Nigeria being second does not indicate that we are better. Because when you look at the mortality rate as a result of breast cancer, the number of women dying from breast cancer, Nigeria is number one. So even though Mauritius may be the first in terms of incidence, when it comes to the mortality rate, Nigeria is number one. And this is due to the lack of uh, proper policy implementation in Nigeria and lack of awareness at the grassroots. The Federal Ministry of Health has a desk called the National Cancer Control Program. It's a desk that is under the ministry, I mean, the Department of Hospital Services. And uh, we have a National Cancer Control Policy 2018 to 2022. Uh, to be honest, not much has been achieved in terms of policy implementation because all the various forms of cancers are covered under that very policy document. But implementation is the major issue we have in Nigeria. And uh, 2022 is fast approaching. Well, we are engaging the ministry we are trying to see how best we can review that policy document so that there will be a continuation or an expansion on the implementation strategies. Now, uh, this is in place. Uh, even in Nigeria here, we talk about policies. Tomorrow, the Honorable Minister of Health will launch some policy documents at the International Cancer Week that is commencing tomorrow. Part of those policy documents is the National Policy on Chemotherapy Safety, the ChemoSafe uh, uh, policy. But our major issue is the lack of implementation. So we hope and pray that we will rally around with other advocates to ensure that we continue to follow up because with proper policy implementation, um, the burden of breast cancer in particular. I'm happy one of the presenters highlighted the fact that there is a there is 1% chance of men that all, also develop breast cancer. So it's not only a woman affair. Men too can have breast cancer. So it is uh, a battle for all of us. 
and we will continue to pursue, we will continue to you know, engage policy makers to create the appropriate policies and to appropriately you know, follow it to full implementation so that we can together uh, reduce the burden of breast cancer in Nigeria. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President of the Nigerian Cancer Society for like, enlightening us on the policy locally and uh, internationally regarding this uh, issue of breast cancer. Uh, the next, we can go to the next speaker, who is uh, a professor of cancer pathology by name, uh, uh, Professor Ayodeji. Uh, this question goes to you. How will I know whether my cancer is invasive or non-invasive? Is there any features to detect? Thank, thank you very much. Uh, first, let me acknowledge my president, uh, the president of the Nigerian Cancer Society, uh, for being on this uh, panel as well. Um, I'm also a member of that, so I need to always acknowledge my president anywhere I see him. Um, I also want to acknowledge all the past uh, speakers, they've done well and they've been able to throw more light on what we are talking about. Uh, for the issue of um, how I'm going to know if my cancer is basic or not. So what it does apply, you know, when you talk about uh, cancers, uh, we have two, can just find it to two. Either it is benign or it is malignant. And so starting from the pictures uh, uh, from outside, when you just say the clinical pictures, uh, we want to see what the patient will come and present to you, what uh, you need to look at when you examine the patient. Uh, the first thing is that we, you know, we always tell them to do self-examination. And uh, when you are doing the self-examination, if you don't express everything to them, it may also be very difficult. Now, for you to differentiate between a benign or invasive, which is malignant tumor, then for a benign tumor, you should be able to when you see the lump in the breast, let me take it from there. When there's a lump in the breast, you, you can check if you can see get over the over the lump. If you can get below the lump, uh, you want to see if the lump is a uh, back of vent, which is around in nature. You also want to see that uh, if the lump is attached to either the overline or other underlying structure. Was it worth to check it? So when you check all these, are you able to see that? Oh, what I'm looking at is that uh, for the benign, you'll be able to get over it. You'll also be able to see that the lump is uh, very circumference in nature, so you can see more of it. And then if you look below it and above it, you you'll be able to get over it. Is that attached to valine structure? Neither it is attached to the line structure. But for a basic one, of course, when you say something is the base, what it means is that it has moved beyond the basement membrane or where it's uh, where it is. So what you show is that the lung does not have the same attention you are talking about any longer. It also shows clearly that it must have been attached either to the line or to the skin. That is covering it. Now, when you take the when you take the loss out and you look at it under the microscope, you also discover that all the parameters you can talk about to make it invasive are there. One, you see that the plomovitin has changed. Plomovitin means that the architecture, the way it looks like, it has also changed. And then you look at the uh, you look at the uh, nucleus cytoplasm ratio. Uh, it has uh, literally, if it's small, that is not a malignant, you see that the nucleus cytoplasm ratio, the nucleus is small, the cytoplasm that we are looking at. By the time it's becoming more malignant, you see more that virtually all the cytoplasm are taken over uh, by these uh, uh, cells. Again, you also see elements that when you look at it, it has seven metastases into the leaf node. Some has even gone into the vascular infection, which is the bloodstream. You see evidence that has invaded into the bloodstream. You see evidence that has also invaded into the lymph node. 
Then again, physically, we also see that patients would have lost weight because the council said that we are talking about is competing with the nutrient that uh, normal cells are supposed to use. So such a person will have lost weight. So basically that everybody will see that it's obvious that this thing is wrong with it. So basically, those are the few uh, things that a lay man should be able to look at as okay. Uh, you should have a benign or you should have a malignant tumor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Props, for this uh, enlightening. I hope our followers were able to differentiate between invasive and non-invasive breast cancer and we'll be able to detect later on, maybe. Um, we are going to uh, the next speaker to answer us these questions. Uh, who is going to be uh, Muhammad, uh, Dr. Mohamed. Um, okay. The question goes like, uh, when should I begin screening for breast cancer? And what treatment options are typically available? Yeah, the screening, the screening of breast cancer, usually we have different guidelines, usually with different different guidelines. We have the American Society of Breast Cancer, but generally the, usually the screening of breast cancer usually starts at the age of 25. From 25, you start screening. And also, if a, there is a family history, a relative or any of the sibling has a breast cancer, maybe at the age of 40, so you start screening 10 years before that, before the age when the relative were diagnosed. For example, if somebody, maybe a sister diagnosed at the age of 40, so you start screening at the age of 30, that is 10 years below the age of diagnosis. And also the screening exercise, we have different screening started from the, starting from the breast self examination in which a woman examine herself monthly in front of, she stay in front of her mirror and examine, look at the, started from the inspection, from the inspection, look at the breast, whether there's any changes in the breast, and also she palpates different quadrant to see whether there is a mass, there's a swelling. So, and also apart from the breast of examination, there's a clinical breast, clinical examination, which is done by a physician to see whether there is a mass in which the patient can go for further further diagnostic this thing like uh, fine needle aspiration or or to talk to, to take a true code biopsy for the final diagnosis and also there is a breast ultrasound breast ultrasound which usually do it between the age of 25 up to 30 35 39 years and also there is a mammogram which is a form like x-ray of the breast which you can start from the age of 40. so all these are the and also mri you can do an mri of the breast as a form of screening so all these form are all these are part of the screening exercise for breast cancer and you usually based on all the protocol usually start after the from 25 offward and also 25 to 49 you can do it annually then after the age of 49 you can do it maybe after two two years and also there's a different modality of treatment of breast cancer, but the treatment depend on the stage, the histological, immunohistochemistry, whether the hormonal positive, hormonal negative, whether the human epidermal growth factor is positive or not, or triple negative, because we have different types of breast cancer. We have what you call lumina E, lumina B, basal, and the isolated HER2. So the treatment depending on each one and also the stage this stage so the treatment in early breast cancer you can start with doing you can do a conservative breast surgery then after that after conservative conservative what i mean by i guess i guess dr Mohammed has some issue with the network um maybe we go to the next speaker who is dr rahmat um Let's just go to the next questions. Um, the next question is, can I have breast cancer in pregnancy? And can I still breastfeed? My daughter been diagnosed with breast cancer. Dr. Ahmad, over to you. OK. Um, a woman can have breast cancer diagnosed during pregnancy. And that is usually referred to as pregnancy-associated um, breast cancer. 
breast cancer that is diagnosed during pregnancy or within the first year of delivery. It is very rare and it's usually occurring about one in um, 3,000 um, pregnant women. And the most important thing is that it's a common malignancy affecting um, pregnant um, women. Also, additional thing to note is that the age at which pregnancy associated breast cancer usually occur is different compared to other women, especially those that don't have any risk factor. And the age at which pregnancy associated breast cancer usually occurs which is between the age of 32 to 38 years old. Um, the risk factor is majorly um, genetic mutation in the so called um, gene that we have been mentioning by different species. Also, in addition, is that um, termination of pregnancy at this particular period, if the woman is still pregnant, does not add any prognostic um, increase, does not add any prognostic factor to the management or the outcome of the disease. Management of um, breast cancer associated uh, pregnancy associated breast cancer is the same way as it is being managed by other. Um, type of um, breast cancer in which the woman is not pregnant or within one year of delivery, which can be either chemotherapy and um, and even um, surgery um, is done. Now, if a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, as, let me say pregnant as she's breast cancer, and she feels breastfed, it is usually recommended that women who are diagnosed with breast cancer, um, why nothing? The best thing they can do is that they should stop breastfeeding. And why should breastfeeding? Uh, many of the therapies can easily be passed from uh, the mother to the child via breastfeeding, which are um, the chemotherapeutic um, agent that are used. And you see, maybe with the hormone therapy that is being used by the mother can easily be what transferred to the baby via breastfeeding. And also the um, anesthetic um, agents that are used during surgery. And the most important advice to give women who, are, who still have baby that are seen breastfed and they are diagnosed of pregnancy associated breast cancer, the best thing for them is to what? To stop breastfeeding and use alternative, whether complementary or supplementary feeding um, um, for the baby. And this is why it's important that for every pregnant woman, you shouldn't have this at the, you should have it at the back of your mind that you are not free from having um, breast cancer as a result of your what, pregnancy. Breast cancer can also what, occur in pregnant women or can also occur within one year um, of delivery of of um, of a baby. You should have um, of delivery of of um, of a baby. Thank you, thank you so much, um, Doctor Rahmat. Hello, I, I have problem with the network. Can I can I continue from where I stop? So Doctor Mustafa. Dr. Yeah, go ahead, Doctor Mustafa. Okay, so in terms of the treatment, I, I have said there is a different modality of treatment for breast cancer. We have the surgery, we have surgery, which we have different surgical procedure. We have the limpect conservative breast surgery, which conservative breast surgery comprises of the lumpectomy, in which you just remove the lump of the breast, and also we have the we have the mastectomy. Then apart from the surgery also, we have the chemotherapy. The chemotherapy, the chemotherapy, chemotherapy usually you can give it as a neoadjuvant or adjuvant. What I mean by neoadjuvant, especially if the tumor, especially if the tumor is fixed to the breast in which surgery cannot be possible. So you can give like three to four courses of chemotherapy. After that, then patient can go for surgery. And after the surgery, you can also give a chemotherapy, which is adjuvant chemotherapy. Usually, chemotherapy in total, we give, we give six to eight cycles of chemotherapy. And apart from the chemotherapy, if the patient is hormonal positive, if the ER estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor is positive, in premenopausal, usually we give a hormonal treatment. We give a tamoxifen. Usually, you can give it between five to ten years. There are, there are different studies that defend giving for five years and also ten years. So you just in postmenopausal, in postmenopausal woman, you give it, you give aromatase inhibitors for five to ten years, depending on the, depending on the response. And also before you give all this treatment, you, usually you need to assess the patient clinically. 
and also to do a tumor marker and also radiological investigation. While on treatment, you assess and see whether the patient, the tumor is regressing. And also, apart from the hormonal too, you can keep, if the, if the patient is HER2 positive, that is the human epidermal growth factor, so you can give an Hasaptin or Pageta. These are the anti HER2 positive. And usually in, in, in locally advanced or early breast cancer, you give it, you give it for one year. But for metastatic, you give it till maybe there is a disease progression or patients stop responding with the treatment or there is a toxicity. So these are the, these are the targeted therapy you give for breast cancer. So these are the forms of treatment you give. And also radiotherapy too. Usually we give radiotherapy in early breast cancer you give and also in locally advanced or metastatic you give. Usually we give radiotherapy in early breast cancer you can give interstitial brachytherapy. It's a form of brachytherapy. What I mean by brachytherapy is that the distance between the source of radiation and the tumor you are treating, they are very close or in contact. Usually we use an interstitial needle. We just place it on the breast. And also, for the locally advanced, usually you give external beam radiotherapy. That's teletherapy. That's the linear accelerator. Patient can go for radiotherapy for five, five to six weeks. And usually it's Monday, five days in a week. Conventional therapy usually. And usually the importance of radiotherapy is to prevent the recurrence of the tumor from the primary side after the surgery so that the tumor will not come back from the primary side. And also, breast cancer can metastasize to different side parts of the body, can go to the brain, spinal, to the spine, and all you can all give radiotherapy to this side as a palliative, form of palliative treatment. So all these are form of radiotherapy you give to a breast cancer patient. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Mamad. Yeah. for shedding more light on the treatment options uh, available for breast cancer patients. Then next we go to Dr. Adamu, the president of the Nigerian Cancer Society to tell us about uh, the universal health coverage. The question goes like that, uh, is universal health coverage possible in Nigeria, especially with regards to the common cancer like cancer, like uh, breast cancer? William, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you very much. Um, universal health coverage is possible. And that is the reason why we always insist that universal health coverage is the only way that Nigerians can have adequate cover for healthcare, particularly as regards uh, cancers. But you know, the problem with us in Nigeria is the fact that uh, we are usually not serious. Because look at the National Health Insurance Scheme, how many years now? But the major attention of government is in the formal sector. The informal sector that has the greater percentage of the population of the country is being neglected. And when you have 49% uh, of uh, the population living below the poverty line and about 50% living in rural areas, you know, the National Health Insurance Scheme covers only a meager less than 10% of the total population. Why? Because it is only the federal government employees that are covered. We thank God, uh, as a result of the, uh, the, the, the enactment of the National Health Act that was passed by the National Assembly and assented to by the president, that mandated the compulsory you know, allocation of 1% of the consolidated budget towards the basic health care provision fund. And that was what gave rise to the states now. Basically, every state now has a state health insurance scheme though implementation is always in a haphazard manner. Why? Because the major, the primary reason is for them to assess the funds coming from Abuja. They don't really have a very solid background back at the states to really address the issue of insurance cover. But at least we are getting somewhere because if not for anything, at least the local government workers, the state government workers are covered under this basic health care provision fund, under this uh, provision of the state insurance schemes. Now, we will continue to call on government to do the needful. Now, breast cancer, luckily, happened to be among the three cancers that's, that the Cancer Health Fund is covering. Uh, the Cancer Health Fund is a, pro a special provision by the Federal Ministry of Health to cater for some form of cancers like uh, breast cancer, prostate cancer, and uh, cervical cancer are the three for now only targeted at indigent patients in six selected hospitals across the country, one per geopolitical zone. 
Now, there is still another concept by the Federal Ministry of Health, which is the CAP. CAP is Cancer Access Program, where even the rich men can now access cancer care at a subsidized rate. You know, about 50% of the cost of care is handled by the government while the patient takes care of the rest. Now, the Cancer Health Fund is what we will continue to advocate for, for it to be more, more inclusive, to have more cancers, more hospitals, more money. In fact, we are looking at a situation whereby eventually this money can be channeled through NHIS to cover for all forms of cancers. I'm happy to say here today that the National Health Insurance Scheme just reviewed it is a strategic document for the next 10 years. And in earlier in March this year, the Nigerian Cancer Society, the Nigerian Medical Association, and the Federal Ministry of Health and of course, with the National Health Insurance Scheme, held a retreat in Abuja. That retreat was aimed at uh, ensuring that, uh, that there is adequate coverage for cancers. You know, and, and, and that, at that retreat, the National Health Insurance Scheme promised uh, the stakeholders that uh, uh, the, the cancer will be well spelled out in the new document, just the way, the same way HIV, for example, is spelled out. And of course, uh, to be optimistic, the question says, is universal health coverage possible? We are very optimistic and we can categorically say as advocates that it is very possible, even though we are not anywhere yet. But it is our belief that we will get somewhere in the coming years. Yes. Thank you very much, um, the president of the Nigerian Cancer Society, Dr. Adamo, uh, for this enlightenment. Hope our followers are enjoying uh, the Q&A on breast cancer. Um, the next uh, speaker is uh, our professor of cancer pathology, uh, Professor Ayodeji. Uh, this question goes to you, please. How will I know the stage of my cancer and what does it mean? When you talk about staging, the staging means um, the extent of the spread. Uh, you know about the, it's usually used in terms of the, we call it deep flow staging. Uh, most of the time, the staging has to do with stage one, two, three, and uh, four. But it has to do with the number of uh, uh, the leaf nodes that are there. It also needs to be involved with where the leaf nodes are. And again, uh, this is not even uh, gone. If, if you have not gone into the living room itself, it's going to take the place. So, in all we, we call, there's what we call transitional progressive factors, uh, which is more or less what was established or developed from the uh, uh, University of Nottingham, calling Nottingham progressive index. Uh, and then the stages are part of the uh, morphological stages that we usually use. And so what they imply is that uh, depending on the stage you are talking about, if it is one, two, three, of course, as we move into one, two, three, it shows clearly the level of spread and what the limitation of what you need to do and how the implication of it in the time of treatment. But now they are we just like other speaker have said, uh, irrespective of the stage that does the, the cancer that you have. Now it is being done in relation to other morphological factors that we have. Uh, for example, if I even have a stage one disease, uh, if, it's, if that person is actually resistant to uh, here, if it belongs to bizarre life, which is where majority of Nigerians are, uh, because 80% of Nigerians are now uh, here negative. Uh, these are stories that we have actually told. These are studies that we actually done uh, doing racial differences between the UK and Nigeria. Um, we've done that for quite a while before we formed an ICAT that we did it for six uh, uh, nations, India, Norway, UK, America, and other. We discovered that uh, in respect of your staging, if the, if the patient you see are negative, for instance, I will see the patient with tamoxifen. There's no way you can even respond to it at all. And if the patient is the best I like, for instance, if the, stage, if the patient is stage one, uh, therapy that chemotherapy 
that they use, only 30% of them will also respond to it. So it shows clearly that, irrespective of staging we talk about, other parameters are also involved in making sure that these things are done. And we also discovered that there are two that my colleagues have mentioned. We also discovered that there's no difference, there's no nature difference in our two status. Either you are, you, you are British or, or you, are, you are Nigerian or Black, is the same between percent and all that. And we also discover that, so what it implies, that in respect of your staging that you must have done, in other parameters in the past, staging are the core that you can use to predict time of process, the time of treatment and all that. But today, as of today, we have discovered that there are so many things that are more involved, more than either your leave node is involved, but uh, they all, not all disease, not all uh, breast cancer will pass through leave nodes. Some uh, can be done through direct spread. Some can be done through hematological spread. Now, of course, if, if many people have talked about the BRCA1 that we have talked about there, uh, which we are, have done virtually all my work, my life on. We also discovered that the majority of them, in respect of the staging that we talk about, that person is BRCA1 negative. But we are, and that is why we have 80% of Nigerians that we have studied long to. Uh, we have a lot of them back around this function. And so even the very really small amount of them that is even here positive, we discovered that the majority of them are also P53 positive, which shows that the majority of them will also be resistant to that of uh, So it shows that we, we we have a long way to go, just like my president said. You know, in, in terms of uh, staging that we always say, uh, of course, primarily that I want to see you up so to today is that uh, the staging show you the level at which the spreading has been in terms of how many leave nodes that are involved, if it's still within the press, if, if it's just the armpits that uh, the, the, the cancer has spread to, or if it has spread to part, virtually every part of the body. Uh, of course, the breast can also spread to, just like our colleague said, the, the bone. That is why. When you examine a patient that like has the breast cancer, you always advise them to remove the IGR so that you can also look at the, the score because it's also metastasized to that plate. So in, in a way, we then discover that the, the staging naturally is all about the level of spread uh, from the breast to the liver, the armpit, the other part of the body. But in respect of staging that we talk about, other parameters are also involved that are more important than even moving to the leave node or wherever. Uh, so if a patient is talking about, how would I know that at my stage, there's no way we know unless it is done on, uh, unless we check it on the medical school. And uh, when, when the surgeons uh, remove the breast, just like uh, my friend has also explained, they take part of the leave node that they have in the armpit. And the leave node, some of them that we also have, within the breast. We then look at it, they tag them, so that we know the flow. So we look at it and see uh, this with the limb that we see within the breast or the limb that we have in the happy that we are talking about. So we have be able to stage it and so we are talking about stage one here, we are talking about stage two here, we are talking about stage three here. And so these are the things that we need to do, but uh, it may not be useful to any patient any longer as the studies are being shown now. They are irrespective of the staging that you have. If you also if you are not sensitive to all the others that our colleagues have mentioned, then it's not, it's not making sense. Uh, looking at uh, what is the stage of, of my breast uh, cancer. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Ayodeji, for giving us more light on the stages of cancer, particularly breast cancer. Next, we will go to Dr. Fatima to answer us these questions. What measures are healthcare workers or the government taking to help reduce the burdens of breast cancer? Dr. Fatima, are you with us? Okay, we move to the next speaker. Hello. 
Let us move to the next speaker, uh, who is Dr. Mohammed again, to answer us these questions. What are the possible side effects of each treatment options, and how can I manage treatment-related side effects? Okay, we have different we have different side effects of the treatment. Let me start from chemotherapy. As you all know, that the chemotherapy can cause we have a specific side effect and general side effects. There is what you call the general side effect in which all patients that does that, one that are going chemotherapy can have nausea, vomiting, body weakness. They can have nausea and body weakness. And also there is a specific to the chemotherapy you are giving. If patient is given anthracycline like adramycin, epirubicin, all these can, can cause a cardiotoxicity. That is why before you commence this treatment with this anthracycline, patient has to go for x-ray and ECG. Sometimes you have to even do echo, echocardiogram to assess the heart before you commence the anthracycline. And also, if your patient is given, if patient is given a platinum-based chemotherapy like cisplatin, carboplatin, patient can have a nephrotoxicity, can have a peripheral neuropathy, and also a patient can have also autotoxicity. So you have to reassess this and also counsel the patient on the possible side effect. And also, patient that is having a, for example, the taxans like doxytaxel, patient can have a pleuritension, severe diarrhea. So that is why there are some things that you need to do before you commence patient on chemotherapy. First thing, usually we give a, what we call pre-medication. That is, we give an ondacetron to prevent the nausea, vomiting, dexamethasone, and also to rehydrate the patient before the chemotherapy. And after the chemotherapy to the patient is placed on post-chemotherapy drugs so as to prevent the patient from the nausea and vomiting. And also the patient is advised to be taking at least three liters of fluid on daily basis from the day of chemotherapy till after a week. So all this can reduce the weakness and also the other side effect too. So apart from the, we have other side effect for, for radiotherapy. Let's talk about the radiotherapy. So radiotherapy too, we have the, what we call acute side effect and chronic side effect. What we call an acute side effect is the side effect that occur within six weeks after the chemotherapy, from the day your patient started the chemotherapy till after six weeks, then what we call chronic, that's after six weeks. So chemotherapy side effect usually depend on the side you are radiating, but the commonly side effect are the patient can have a skin side effect in which the patient can have a skin erythema, patient can have a skin disquamation, which can be a dry and wet disquamation. So, and also patient can have dermatitis. All these are side effects of radiotherapy too. And also patient can have a, patient also can have a weakness. So all this, that is why we advise patient, even patient undergoing radiotherapy to take too much fluid while on radiotherapy. And also the, usually what you normally tell patient to prevent all this scary action usually we usually tell the patient they shouldn't put a water at the site where we give radiotherapy so as to prevent all this skin discrimination, wet and dry, and the skin erythema. And also, depending on the site, if you are radiating a breast, patient can have, if, if you can have a radiation to the lungs. Usually, there is what we call, we give a central lung distance of two centimeters. So you can, patient can have a lung fibrosis. And also, patient can have, can have a, radiate to different parts if let me just give an example of for the breast patient can have a also a necrosis of the bone maybe the bone you are close to the target volume you are treating and also let's talk about the targeted therapy for patient having herceptin that is the her two positive patient so they can have a herceptin usually the major side effect is the cardiotoxicity that is why usually we don't combine anthracycline and herceptin at the same time because all of them can cause cardiotoxicity. So if you combine the two, the, the probability of having pay, for patient to have cardiotoxicity is more. So you have to finish anthracycline before you commence the herceptin. So these are the possible side effects. And also, that is why anytime you are giving herceptin, maybe before you start, patient has to do echo, ECG, maybe after three, each three cycle, then you... You, you repeat it again. And also the hormonal treatment too. Hormonal treatment too, you, like tamoxifen you are giving, there is a 1% chance of patient to have a 
hyper, endometrial hyperplasia. But if you look at the benefit, and the benefit usually is better to give compared to the risk of having endometrial hyperplasia. And also, there can be a cessation of the cessation of the menses. Men's it's possible if you are given the hormonal treatment too. And also, if you look at the surgery, surgery too has some side effect too. You can have a side effect. Patient can have a hematoma, that is collection of the blood. And also, patient can have seroma, that is collection of the fluid. And also, patient can have a lymphedema, especially a patient that undergo the axillary dissection can have a lymphedema, that is swelling of the limb, and also can have a pain pain is possible after the surgery. So all these are the side effects of the treatment. And also each side effect, you have to prevent it. You have to make sure you do as much as you can to prevent the side effect too. So these are the possible side effects of different treatment, hormonal treatment, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and targeted therapies. So I don't know whether there is another thing you want me to add. Wonderful. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Mohammed. Okay. For giving us more light on the side effects of these optional treatments for breast cancer. We'll now go to um, Professor uh, Ayodeji for the next questions. How do I determine the size of my tumor and why does that matter? Well, um, thank you very much uh, for that question. How do you determine the size of the tumor? Uh, a patient cannot determine the size of the tumor. Although we always say that uh, if you use the figure tips, if you want to the figure tips, the first line that you have on your finger, that will give you not less than two CL. So if you measure it up to that, and it's up to two CL, forget it, that can't solve the number of size. So the correct way of checking the size of the tumor is to dilute that. Uh, the geologist will help you do that and check the size of the tumor either from there. Although, as pathologists, we also measure it uh, in the first session. We use a, use a ruler to measure it. But the correct means of getting the tumor size is to go to a geologist. And that's the geologist who need to do that for us. Um, again, well, it's part of uh, the traditional that uh, we were talking about before, the traditional population control department. Uh, the part is uh, one of the things that we actually use to tell you the patient, if it's less than one cell, that patient has a 90% chance of uh, not having the CFA in our and uh, having a 90 percent chance of six free cover of 10 years, uh, if, the, if the tumor size is less than one cell. But if you see it, what will venture to see it, and it's more than 1.5 to 2 cell, it is an indication that that tumor must have a pesticide. Now, for all the papers that we have published uh, in comparison even with the what we did was to certify the uh, patient of less than 2 cm, uh, tumor size of 2 cm, a patient of uh, size, of, size of 2 cm. Uh, uh, they actually bought a two CM. They actually bought a two CM from the Nigeria. Then we we'll always look at it from the point of. Uh, well, it's also having the application of speed. Uh, well, it's also having the application of speed. It has the application of speed because uh, time dependent. The application of speed because time dependent on the. Second, uh, the second, uh, the second. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you, Prof. Hello. Okay. Hear you, Prof. Okay. Okay. Now, what I'm doing now is that. Okay. What I'm doing now is that. Um, um, the screen. Um, when the screen is spinning. When 
a good spinning. Very hard. The 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 Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much, Prof. And next we are we are going to um Dr. Fatima. And next can you we, hear are, us? we are going to um Dr. Fatima. Can you hear us? Yes, please, yeah, I can hear you. This question goes to you. I can hear you. Can you yeah. hear me? What measures yeah, are this question goes to you for the government yeah. taken? What measures are healthcare the burden of breast cancer? For the government taken to reduce the burden of breast cancer. Okay, um, thank you for the question. Sorry for all the mishaps from the beginning. It's network issues. Um, so the measures the healthcare workers or the government are taking towards the, um, the prevention or the reduction of the burden of breast cancer can actually be discussed based on um, primary prevention, secondary prevention, or um, tertiary prevention. Now, um, these measures at the primary level for the government, it is actually based on the policies that the government um, make for reducing the burden of um, the disease. Now, in the on the part of the healthcare workers, for primary prevention is basically advocacy, advocacy, and advocacy. It is very good to make people to be aware that this disease is, is, is real and this disease is, is actually preventable to some extent, especially if the individual doesn't have the non-modifiable risk factors that were earlier talked about, like genetic predisposition. So those ones that can actually prevent the disease are those ones that have the um, modifiable risk, uh, that are prone to having the modifiable risk factors like um, physical inactivity and all. So basically for prevention, is um, for primary prevention is basically um, advocacy. Talk to people about the disease let them know the, the risk factors associated with the disease and they can actually prevent it. For the secondary prevention is basically um, early, early diagnosis, treatment, and then um, prompt treatment in general. For early diagnosis, as there was a speaker that spoke initially about the diagnosis of breast cancer, all the modalities of breast cancer, healthcare workers are supposed to put in place to help to diagnose this disease early. However, the government is also supposed to provide to various health institutions and health centers, prevent um, diagnostic materials so that they can actually use in diagnosis of um, breast cancer. Now, 
the tertiary part is actually basically um, rehabilitation of these patients. Someone actually talked about the side effects of the um, treatment of breast cancer. Basically, not just the side effects of the treatment, but also even the disease on its own has some form of psychological um, trauma on the patient. So rehabilitating these patients afterwards after the diagnosis, treatment, and for further monitoring is quite important. I think um, to some extent, these are some of the measures that I actually think the healthcare workers or the government can actually put in place to help reduce the burden of um, breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Fatima. The next we go to uh, Dr. Mohammed. Are you with us? Okay. Question is, yes. uh, will my breast cancer treatment affect my ability to have a baby? Yeah, let me, uh, usually, before you, have a, before you have a baby, if you have breast cancer, you have to discuss with your doctor, because in early breast cancer, in early breast cancer, you are aiming at cure. But if you are treating patients with advanced breast cancer, at that time you are aiming at palliation, that is the improving the quality of life of the patient. So in early breast cancer, it will not affect the delivery because there is a different study done which by using a what we call gran granulocyte clonic stimulating granulocyte uh, gran gra uh, gra where we use, there is, there is a study I think I think let us just move to the next questions if he's fine. The next question goes to uh, Professor Ayodeji. Are you with us? Should I consider genetic testing when I have breast cancer? Help. Why well, not all cases? Hello. Hello, Amelia. Not all cases are requiring you to do that. Um, some of our colleagues have also answered the question in a way. You know, breast cancer are caused basically by two, whether it is genetics or familiar, which is caused by environmental, which is known as sporadic or environmental factors. Uh, for the genetics, you will suspect that you know, those ones that are hereditary and you have your family history showing clearly that uh, the people in your family. At least the first uh, generation, the first line, uh, like a, a mother to sister having a breast cancer, and they also establish that, and then you can you can talk about the genetic um, testing of BRCA1. Um, not all cases that you talk about BRCA2 as well. In, in, all, in some of the cases that you have also seen, um, even BRCA1 is not all in all. You know, because BRCA1 is more useful when you talk about homologous um, recombination. The BRCA1 is not that not useful in non homologous uh, and rejoining pathway, where we have majority of cases in Nigeria being, being appearing. Of. So, um, in, in, in by, by and large, if, if the case does not have anything to do with the electricity, and it has to do with the environmental factor, just like our colleagues have said, you have not used the breastfeeding for a while. Um, people, uh, you have to do with eating of diet, uh, with people that are taking more fatty food rather than vegetable and fruit, people that refuse to do exercises. Because even, even when you talk about obesity, obesity you can also lead to cancer in postmenopausal, whereas obesity is preventive in premenopausal because it has to do with the source of physiology that we are talking about. So, in all cases, what I'm trying to say is that not all cases will require genetic testing, but they only require genetic testing when you suspect that the majority of them are actually through the familiar uh, uh, cases, call it familiar. Uh, so those people that are more of a hereditary in nature. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Prof. Hello. Yes, Dr. Mustafa, are you with us? Yeah, can I answer my... Yes. Yeah, yeah sorry, how you should...
of this so because I, I just came into Abuja I used three different networks but I have issue with the network so yeah what I what I cancer so usually we discourage the, uh, getting having baby especially in ad locally advanced or metastatic brain. early breast cancer, you can sit down with the patient and discuss what you normally use. We usually give Zolodex before, the, before we commence the chemotherapy. So usually we give Zolodex two weeks before commencement of chemotherapy, that's Zolodex. And also there are different studies that show after chemotherapy, usually more than 80% of the patient with breast cancer conceive. So, and also they deliver a healthy babies using the Zolodex. And also, and what I want to emphasize is that before you get pregnancy, you need to see your doctor so that he can advise you whether it's the right for you to go to have a baby or not. Because if you are aiming at palliation, improving quality of life of the patient, at that stage, usually you are not aiming at cure. The survival is minimal. At that stage, usually we don't encourage patient to go to have pregnancy. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mustafa. The next question also goes to you again. Um, okay. After my breast cancer surgery, will I need a radiation or chemotherapy or both? And what is the difference between radiations and chemotherapy? Okay. The radiotherapy, you, you give radiotherapy in all stages of breast cancer, whether stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four. So there is indication for each stage. For early stage, stage one, stage one, usually you give a, what we call a brachytherapy. After conservative breast surgery, you can give a brachytherapy, which is an interstitial brachytherapy. It's just form of needle. You just put it in the breast and the patient can have a radiation there. In locally advanced breast cancer, patient can have an external beam radiotherapy, that's what you call a linear accelerator. Patient can have it. And also, in metastatic breast cancer, patients that have a metastasis to the brain, usually we give a radiation to the brain so as to improve the quality of the patient because most of the patients can have a serious headache, seizure. So giving radiotherapy, you are usually improving the quality of the patient. And also, patients can have a spinal metastasis. You can give a radiation to the spine so as to maybe to improve the quality of life of the patient. So these are the form of radiotherapy you give. So radiotherapy can be given in all stages of breast cancer. And radiotherapy is just use of ionizing radiation. We use ionizing radiation for the treatment of cancer. But while chemotherapy, usually we use an antimitotic agent for the treatment of malignancy. So chemotherapy usually can be given too. Usually you can give chemotherapy locally advanced disease and also in metastatic too. In locally advanced for example, if the tumor is fixed, you can give a neoadjuvant, you can give before the surgery, then after the surgery, you can complete the remaining causes of chemotherapy too. And also, patients that had mastectomy too, or conservative breast surgery, after that patient too can undergo chemotherapy too. So in all stages of breast cancer, patients can benefit from radiotherapy, and also chemotherapy can be given in locally advanced and also, ad and also in metastatic breast cancer. So these are the questions I answer. So I don't know. Thank you. I, Thank you so no, much, any... um, Dr. Mustafa. Okay. The next we will go to uh, Raida, uh, who is also a physiologist and have uh, his, uh, a family history of uh, breast cancer. I want to share uh, more lights on what breast cancer is. Uh, particularly, this question goes to you. Is there a family history of breast cancer and what message would you like to provide to women in the country those with breast cancer? Okay, good evening everyone. Um, breast cancer as it is, is, is an ailment that kind of, it changes your life totally if you're not careful. So most times, um, the advice I give, seeing my grandma and my aunt, and I also have, my younger sister had a lump. She removed it. Luckily, we, we saw that in time. Having that um, 
family history of breast cancer. I've seen it, apart from breast cancer as it is, other ones, I've seen how they, how they come about, how they grow, how, how it can be, how very dangerous it can be. So what I just tell people, first of all, is you should actually know your family history because you might have had, someone in your family might have had it and you know about it. And people sometimes keep it to themselves because of stigmatization. So we should try as much as possible not to stigmatize so that people can come out, just like people come out to say, I have hypertension and things like that. So apart from stigmatization, good diets and exercise, the monthly checkup during your menses, the self-examination, and also a community, maybe like a WhatsApp community for people that must have had it in your locality, so that it, it's not like I'm the only one with this thing. It's not like you just come together and share your experiences. You know you're not the only one. You can help each other out of depression when you talk about what you passed through and you can hear someone's own is either worst or the same you have people that can think the way you are thinking so they kind of know okay this is how it is this is what it is so i would say people should come together the community should actually come together one-on-one -on -one, and it can start from the hospital because i don't know what is happening in the next house so maybe when they come for checkups in the hospital from the hospital with their um their information they can come together and have a platform where they can also relate with each other and then they won't they won't get into depression and harm themselves you know things like that so and you also try to present to the hospital very early when my grandma had it i was the first person that saw it then she was like there's something in her breasts i think she was about 65 then like eight years ago Maybe more than eight, I'll say 12 years ago. She was like, there's something there she doesn't know. And then I tried to feel it. I didn't really get anything. I was like, maybe it's a boil. Then after four weeks, she complained again. At that time, it was bigger. So we had to go to the hospital. And then they checked. And they said it was a lump. She got it removed. And suddenly, after two months, another one, there were two other ones. Then they went and they with all the examination it now happened to be breast cancer after a year chemo radio and all that they had to cut that breast out and eventually it had it spread all over her second breast they cut it out and at a point you could you could touch the lungs it was at her back eventually she died anyways but i think when we did it very early it actually helps and we should also know our family history so you don't go eating anyhow doing things just you just be self-conscious so i think that's all i have to say um thank you so much uh Ryder. i think you you have answered part of uh the subsequent questions which we wanted to ask uh, ask you already um but maybe you may wish to share more light on the second part of the questions how did you feel when you first received the news that uh, your relatives had uh, uh, cancer or detected, the cancer was detected in him or her? Okay. I just immediately, I just felt, oh, she was going to die. That was, I just felt initially, like, oh, this is death. Then eventually, with more knowledge, going to the hospital, <laughs> taking drugs and all that, I saw some survival. So, most times with what i've seen it has to do with detection because i think after then she, she, she spent 12 more years before her death so we shouldn't think it's a death sentence though it's very sad but we should not think it's a death sentence and also the family should be very supportive it should not just be left to the woman the wife and the children because she's just the custodian of her breast most times apart from being cosmetic it's for the children and for the husband right, to a certain extent. So the support, the family support is very important. Thank you very much, uh, Raida.
Um, with this, uh, I think we have come to the end of our Q1A uh, regarding breast cancer. However, uh, let me just go through if there are some questions from the audience. I think here yeah, one guy is asking, uh, maybe our speakers will be able to share more light on what these handheld devices, the eye breast in screening for uh, breast cancer. Any of the speakers, if you are interested to share more light on what is the role of this hand, hand, handheld device, the eye breast. Where is Dr. Fatima? Dr. Fatima, are you with us? Dr. Fatima, where is she? Is she in the room? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, Please come and talk you. about this. Yes, we can Please hear come you. and talk about this. Okay, um, the eye breast is actually a latest technology that has been devised, you know, to or has been developed to actually help diagnose um, breast cancer, especially in um, women within the reproductive age group. But then also it can also be used for um, women that are much more older. It uses um, the latest technology and it just helps generally to diagnose breast cancer early. In addition to this, there are also some other, um, what do you call it, applications that are also used, um, like, how would I put it, some NGOs actually have actually developed some certain applications also that you can actually visit and then that will actually help to diagnose um, breast cancer. Some of them, like the Seve Breast app that we have in the OCI Foundation, you can actually go in and then follow the guidelines there and help with diagnosis. But this eye breast in particular is used in hospitals for the diagnosis of breast cancer. I don't know, to some extent, I think that's basically what I know about it. Only if another person has something to add. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Fatima. Is any of our speaker uh, willing to share more light on this? Or without further ado, we move on to the next. Okay, um, in the absence of um, further questions from our audience, uh, with this, we come to the end of the questions and answer. Uh, to create awareness among the publics, particularly in Nigeria, organized by the Nigerian Science Communication Hub, uh, in collaborations or in, with support from African Archive and Trains in Africa. With this, uh, I would like to thank our speakers, the finalists, uh, the six speakers, particularly the presidents of the Nigerian Cancer Society, uh, Dr. Adam uh, Al Hassan Umar. Thank you very much uh, for being with us here in these platforms to create more awareness on cancer. And um, to the second speaker, uh, Dr. Mustafa, who is uh, also a consultant radiation and oncologist from uh, Munich Community Hospital. So we thank you so much for the input and insightful uh, uh, information you provided regarding uh, breast cancer. And as well, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Rahmat. Uh, you did well. Uh, well job, uh, well done uh, to, uh, to you uh, for the great uh, information you share with us. And as well, uh, Dr. Fatima, thank you so much uh, for sharing more light on breast cancer. And um, the last but not the least, I think uh, Professor Ayodeji for sharing more information on the, uh, uh, cancer pathology itself, as well as the uh, genetic testing on breast cancer. Uh, to conclude with uh, the, uh, Mr. Ryder, thank you so much too for sharing your experience uh, with your relatives who had uh, cancer. And uh, thank you very much with this. I think uh, I would like to uh, thank you so much and end the programs here. I don't know if you have something to add more, particularly the president of the Nigerian Cancer Society. I don't know if you have something to add before we end. No, no, I, I just, I, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, no, I just want to salute the 
the courage of uh, people like Dr. Mustafa Inua, Professor uh, Agbola, and others who have the patriotic zeal to stay and continue to offer their services to the nation. Because the reality is government is not taking the welfare of medical personnel. The brain drain that we are recording, that we have recorded in 2021 alone is quite alarming. And sincerely speaking, we should salute them for staying back at home to ensure that the health system improves. And of course, you know, for those at the grassroots, you know, giving out information to the community, we must salute all of them. People uh, that are giving inspirational courage to survivors, you know, to, to continue to make the noise, to create that awareness, because awareness is the ladder to early detection. And, you know, uh, the government uh, should be up and doing to provide the necessary environment for our health system to grow. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, with this, I think we can end the programs. So we hope uh, you will still participate in our subsequent uh, enlightenment campaigns uh, using science communication hope and feel free to share and join our YouTube channels to watch some of the webinars we did in the past, particularly on the COVID-19 as well as this one. And we hope to receive uh, uh, other related topics that you may wish to share more light to the public. Uh, thank you so much. So with this, we come to the ends of the programs. Thank you very much. Uh,